Hi everyone, and uh, thanks for coming to this talk. I am uh, Tor Frick, and I'm creative director uh, at Neon Giant. And uh, I hope you are not too hungover because today we're going to talk about pipelines and art and all that fun stuff. And uh, this presentation is uh, about how we built the uh, world of the Ascent, both you know how we set our visual goals and also like, like the artistic the artistic goals that we had, and also how we how we reach those and the pipelines that we use to reach those goals. So, to start things off, here's a small trailer for you who don't know what the ascent is, or how it looks. You have shown an aptitude for applying lethal solutions to conflicted situations. It looks like we're gonna have to work together on this one. Let's get it done! Alright, so... The Ascent is a uh, solo and co-op action RPG. It's made in Unreal Engine 4. It's available on all the platforms, basically, except Switch. Um, and uh, it is the first game from uh, Neon Giant. And uh, we are a small independent studio from uh, Uppsala in Sweden. And we, we started about four years ago, and this is our you know, first game. And uh, the team is made up, or like when we made the, the Ascent, the team was made up of uh, 12 uh, developers internally. Uh, we, of course, that doesn't include contractors and, and partners and so on. And uh, so uh, we have a small but amazingly talented team that I'm, you know, very humbled to work alongside with every day. And we all come from a AAA background, and uh, those are some of those, you know, sensitivities that we brought with us. But also, like those are also some of the working methods that we, you know, wanted to challenge and, and do a little bit differently. And uh, our visual goals, like. When we started out, I was the uh, I was the only artist, and it was basically like I want to make it look good, and uh, we were you know a small indie startup with you know a couple of people, so the ambitions were not very grand, um, and the the top down genre is not traditionally heavily graphics focused, and uh, compared to other genres, but it also does represent represent a number of limitations and challenges visually, but also a lot of opportunities, especially if you're a small and uh, flexible and agile team. So first I will show you some prototype footage from 2018, which is more than three years from uh, launch. And this is from our first prototype like that we made after a couple of months. And at that point I was the only artist on the team. So you can see the animations are amazing. And uh, the vision was about, uh, you know, a lot more humble, but the building blocks and the ideas were kind of there already. And uh, if we compare this to the final game, it obviously looks a lot better, but a lot of the content is actually the same. You know, it's the same master shaders, it's, you know, same models and so on. It's just the usage that is different. So this is from the final game. And uh, finding what worked visually was a very iterative process. So at first it was just me on the art team. And uh, I was just freestyling. I was like, oh, I want to build a thing. So I just build stuff. And uh, there was no real direction put into place until we actually had other artists on the team and I had to explain to them what is it that we're building. And uh, I've worked on a large pile of third person and first person games, but I've never really worked with uh, one with this camera perspective. And uh, we quickly found what worked and what didn't because I've always been a, a fan of, you know, grand scale and, you know, verticality, but also I'm a fan of, uh, you know, making very detailed sci-fi. And, you know, this camera angle is bad for both of those things. And we had to find ways to make that work. And we wanted to push beyond what you typically see in this genre in terms of visuals. And uh, to, do, to help us achieve that, we had a number of rules that we put into place for, for how to achieve this. So, for example, with the grand scale, we wanted to achieve, you know, an epic scale uh, at most times, right? And... Uh, in FPS, for example, you know, that's, it's a lot different because you have your little toolkit of how, how do you achieve, you know, this feeling of a grand scale and how to maximize that. And 
a lot of those tricks don't work with a top-down camera. So we had to find our own tools and rules to achieve that. And uh, having a top-down camera limits the scale in many cases, because when you can freely look around, I mean, you can achieve scale wherever you want, right? But our camera is pointing downwards. So the only way we can create an epic scale is to you know, push downwards at all times. And if you go upwards, you know, things are just going to get in the way of the camera really quickly and it becomes really annoying. So we just push downwards at every opportunity that we get. So for example, here we have a, uh, a gameplay space. Uh, and the gameplay space in a top-down game is essentially two-dimensional, right? And it's flat, and that's not very grand. So we need to you know, take every opportunity to push downwards. So we take things that would normally be a cover, for example, and we you know, we turn it into a hole instead. So when in doubt, we just make a hole. So the parts where the game looks the worst is where the screen is basically just full of floor, because that's no fun at all. And uh, it's bad for navigation, because you're just running around blind, like you, you don't have anything to navigate by. And thankfully, it's also quite detrimental to gameplay, because you don't have any covers. And we use a lot of, you know, breaking line of sight and cover and things like that. So we just had to think invertedly, and instead of adding things, we just subtracted things. And uh, this is a good way to fit lot, a lot more art onto the screen. So, for example, here we have like a hole, you know, punching downwards, and then we have a hole in the hole to push inwards, and then sometimes we put like a third hole in that hole. So we just like try and just push inwards into the screen so we can fit as much, you know, you know stuff as possible. Like we have yet to achieve a scene that is, you know, too epic. So we just shove everything we can at every opportunity. And uh, just like with verticality and scale, detailing uh, a game like this is also a, a journey of discovery because we wanted the game and the world to be detailed and dense, but the best way to do that was to not make the most detailed assets. So the quantity goes first and the fidelity goes second, especially because of the camera distance and we wanted the world to feel pretty believable and that meant it needs to be filled with objects basically and we that means we had to prioritize the amount of objects instead of the fidelity it's more important for us to have like a cd bar full of stuff that has like low fidelity than to have a bar with like a very few but very nice looking objects and at the same time we also want to trick people that we have more detail than we do um, so the designs are, you know, pretty complex. You know, we have lots of cables, we have lots of pipes, you know, chunky sci-fi shapes, but they're all very low poly. But we try to, uh, we try to trick, uh, well, we try to trick people. I mean, that's what we do in games, but we zoom in quite often, like for intimacy, like for example, when you're talking to a vendor or something like that which helps you know to ground you in the world and make it for like feel more like human scale and you know accurate but it also makes you know the scale feel grander when you zoom back out again right so we try to up the detail level every time that we zoom in not by you know making custom assets because we didn't have time for that but instead we just have more assets and we put a lot more care into the composition and the decals and the lighting so for example when talking to an npc or a vendor so you know you zoom in the game looks real good Zoom out, people are like, oh yeah, I remember like how that looked when when I zoomed in. And then people like, you know, that stays with them and they kind of like feel like they can see the detail that they can't really feel. Or, and then they just think the rest of the game looks as good as well, but it doesn't. And uh, we just abuse depth of field to hide, you know, the inadequacies of the models. Like you have a monitor up there, which is like nicely in depth of field, so you can't see it's basically a box. So we just try to trick everyone. And uh, also because I love depth of field, it's, you know, it's so hot. Um, so we also wanted to design things with the camera distance and the performance target in mind. We, uh, we needed things to look good at a you know, far away-ish distance on very low settings on console, which meant that we went for larger, softer bevels, um, combined with, you know, chunky sci-fi shapes, things that pick up lighting, uh, like, really well, and shift the focus away from the limitations in the rendering. Uh, because if you have smaller, harder, more, you know, square-looking sci-fi, 
that's a lot more sensitive to things like anti-aliasing and you know shadow problems and things like that. But with softer and you know more solid shapes and the right scale of details, you get away with a lot more. And uh, we had to find a balance between you know forsaking the small detail, but also you know trying to stay on the edge of what actually makes sense visually. Like how much detail can we shove in there before it's you know introducing too much rendering noise. And we had a constant battle between wanting to have you know, a very high detail level and at the same time making the game at least you know, somewhat readable. And uh, we had a few simple rules uh, for the art direction of the game. It was very like, loose. Like, we, didn't have, you know, we didn't really have much iteration and, and concept art and stuff. But we had a bunch of you know, very simple rules. One of them is that we're grouping details and assets together because we want that density. But we can't just have an even density because it just becomes noise. So we group things together. So instead of one air conditioning unit, we have 20. You know, instead of like a, one fan, we have like a whole pile of them. Instead of like a few trash bags, we have like a giant mountain of trash bags. And we're trying to push those details to the edges of the gameplay space. Because the floors are flat, but the edges and walls are kind of where, where we put all our detail. And we push them out, you know, you have the trash bags and things like that, and then you... we pushing you know downwards and inwards all the time so we always have a lot of vista space to play with and that's where we put like most of the detail and uh, the good thing is that we have a fixed camera direction which means that we can play with the profile like visually basically hacking whatever we want like if it looks good from the camera angle it goes doesn't matter what it is if even if it's you know like some you know, cables that are actually just hanging in the air. If, like we take some asset, we flip it, we scale it up, put it in shadow, we just do whatever we want. As long as it looks good from the camera, it's fine because we, no one can actually see how hacky it is until we release the photo mode. Uh, and, uh, and then we try to, you know, break up the floor surface a little bit. You know, we're adding some cut lines and panels and things like that. And we probably do, you know, too much of that to, to make it readable, but, you know, it is the, what pl the player is staring at most of the time, so you know, we have to do something. And with these you know, rather grand uh, ambitions uh, for a you know, fresh new indie team, so how did we actually achieve this? So there are a few obvious challenges. You know, first of all, we need to make a lot of content very fast with a very flexible pipeline. So we need it to be very fast. And uh, we also had... Uh, to create a pipeline that was not only fast and flexible, uh, we also needed to uh, uh, we also needed it to be uh, working with our very visually demanding art style uh, because we have man-made surfaces. You know, it's a very lived-in and dirty setting. Our pipeline needed to be able to meet the demands of the art style as well, not just being fast. And also, we also have a giant world to build. Uh, just assembling the world itself is another big challenge because it's. It's a lot of assets and it's not so many people. And we also wanted to you know, inject a feeling of life into the world, which meant you know, just placing a bunch of meshes wasn't enough. We needed to do, do more things. So that's another challenge. And uh, this is an example of the scale of the world. This is like a third of the game world or something like that. And then we do like a little CSI enhance. So, and it has like this density like throughout basically. And this is like one third of the game or something like that. So there was a lot of space to cover. So, you know, just starting with the models itself, like we needed something that was very, very, very fast. You know, like it, it needed to be, to be able to output a lot of models really quickly. It also needed to uh, maintain the, uh, the uh, direction with like a minimum of effort because we don't have time for effort. And uh, we, uh, we, we didn't have time to stop and iterate on things. So we needed a direction that was very clear initially and it also needed to be able to like, the, the pipeline needed to help the artist to hit the direction. And uh, you know, it also needs to be very flexible like when we actually need to iterate on something. So. Thankfully, we didn't need to make, you know, AAA quality models because of the camera distance and all those things, right? So we had a bunch of options. You know, for example, a traditional method with a high poly and a low poly workflow, that just doesn't work. Not just because it's slow to, you know, make a high poly, low poly, bake them, do all of that. 
it's just too many steps and you import the textures and you have to set up the materials and it's just like too much and you can't iterate quickly on it either right so tiling materials and decals that's also you know that's a lot more flexible but then instead we have a very uh we want to have this very chunky detailed sci-fi style uh, and that doesn't go very well with tiling materials we need you know baked elements we also need a lot of you know shading that would be very hard to get in a fast way with just tiling materials so how about trim sheets much better uh, you get a lot more details with a lot less effort but you know it's perfect for sci-fi panels and things like that but it's not very good for like chunky little mechanical bits and stuff like that and we do want chunky mechanical bits or i want I want chunky mechanical bits and uh, it's also too expensive to just do all those bits with like trim sheets because then you need to unwrap every single little part and it just become tons of verticals and uh, it was also like uh, yeah it would just be a, it would just be a pain uh, anyway, how about we have one set of baked assets and then you know one trim sheet and we mix them that would work, except we also need a shitload of assets, so we need to keep the draw cost down. So, uh, but we really need those baked bits, right? So what we did was that we just combined both of that into one texture sheet. And we uh, sacrificed a little bit of space in our, uh, in our trim sheet to have baked parts inside the same texture sheet. Uh, that meant that we could... Uh, we could do one asset that had both baked parts and that had, you know, generic tiling kit bashed parts. And uh, this meant like we can't scale assets up, like we can't make assets that are like, you know, 100 meters like in size and they get very close to the camera. Like it doesn't work. Like we need, there's like a fixed size on assets that we can make, right? It's a 4K texture and, you know, it doesn't scale, you know, infinitely, right? But it also makes trim sheets like a lot harder to author because you need to not only do like the you know the easy tiling you know parts you also need to do a lot of like very complex you know small mechanical modeling with very optimized small low poly parts and it's just a bit of a pain in the ass to do it um so we just didn't uh and uh, this is our texture that has like even has saved some space because we're totally going to add more things when we know what we need and then we just didn't so we just have you know a bunch of unused space in it and uh, and that's what basically what we rolled with and you can have like almost any workflow you want these days like in, in unreal i mean you, there's so many different you know approaches like do you want to use tiling materials do you want to do decals do you want to do like a uniquely texture thing do you want to do different you know a more high res texture or do you want to do like multiple smaller normal maps and you blend between them and it's a little bit of a pain because like every time you're going to approach an asset, you're like, oh, how do I make this in the best way? Um, which is, you know, good, but it also means that you have to stop and think. And we don't want to think, we just want to build stuff. So, because we wanted, wanted speed, right? And uh, our focus is the big picture. And we want to get to there as quickly as possible. So, we used this workflow for almost all the assets. It was... Uh, it meant we had to cut a lot of corners because there's a lot of things that we couldn't do, but we just didn't have time to stop and do every single thing we wanted. We, we limited ourselves to like, let's do the things that we can make a pipeline for that is really, really efficient. And we knew how far away the camera was. We know what fidelity it was. We didn't, we didn't need to make things that were better looking than they had to be because we focused on the big picture instead of making very nice looking assets. Our assets are not very good looking. Uh, but the game is, I hope. And the good thing was like, since we already had a fixed pipeline, like this is what, this is how we're building our assets. We didn't have to stop and figure things out. We can just like, I'm gonna build this asset. I'm gonna hack it together using the workflow and do the best that I can. And often that was enough. You know, it looked good enough to make, to serve its purpose in the scene. And uh, the good thing is that we had this shared library like of a kit bashed elements and so on, which meant that more things we built the more we could reuse them because every hard surface object in the entire game is using the same texture every mech every vehicle sci-fi wall computer table chair bottle plastic boxes everything that is not made from concrete basically is using the same texture so you know you have the ships in the background you had like the little you know the floor tiles railings the you know like little 
forklift and stuff like that. And the more we built, we could just copy paste because everything shared the same setup. So, you know, I built a nice little detail on the forklift, copy paste that, you know, just forever growing the library of things that we kit bash. So it just becomes faster and faster. So to summarize it, we basically split between a, uh, you know, trim sheet and a baked pieces. And then we used weighted normals to just make them shade more nicely. And uh, we used one texture for all objects, basically. And we only used low poly geometry. We didn't have, like, I think we had like a few models that had like a low and high bake, like the guns and stuff like that. But almost everything just had low poly geometry and it was very low poly. But that also meant that we, we didn't have to care. Like if you needed polygons to do something, you just did it. You didn't have to care. And uh, we did uh, extend this with some mesh decals here and there for things when the, the tr when the trim sheet just wasn't enough. You needed something that it couldn't, it couldn't do. And we mostly used that on things like more, more custom things like mechs and, and, and spaceships and stuff like that. But that's not enough, right? Like we, we've done the modeling, but we still need to have textures. And uh, that's the second challenge. How do we make this dirty and gritty world without actually making any textures? Uh, because, you know, we need to have a lot of variety and we need to do, to do it with basically little to no work. So dirt is, like dirtier things are harder to make than clean things because clean things just don't have anything on them. And dirt, you can't just put random dirt. It needs to have like context. It needs to be in the right places. Otherwise it just looks weird. So first of all, it's just like a, a basic thing. Like how do we even have colors on the meshes? So we can't just have one color per asset. And we, we can't do textures because we don't have time for that. It's just gonna, we have, you know, thousands of assets. We don't have time to make thousands of textures. So we just use a mask for different colors, uh, but not a texture mask because we don't have time for that. So we just used a UV space mask, which is essentially UDIMS. And we just shifted the UVs and we masked between like different uh, colors uh, that way. So here, for example, you know, now we've masked out like a few colors and the primary materials that we need is basically like we have painted metal, we have plastic, we have, you know, uh, bare metal. And that's like the basic materials that we use for the most part. And uh, we added like uh, the same kind of UV masking, but also to mask out if things were like pure metal or just not. And uh, that gave us you know, a lot of material breakup. Now we can have things like there's a metal railings, there's like different colors, but we still need textures. And we need something that looked as close to hand authored, hand textured as possible with, you know, as little work as possible. And uh, we did a bunch of experimentation and we ended up with like, you know, like a bunch of layers of things that we just built up to reach like the, the, the goal. So since we had a trim sheet, we could just, you know, add some basic shading in that. Trim sheets are great because you can build in a lot of like the small scale AO, small scale, uh, you know, like wear and tear in the materials. And you can just make some, you know, unique masks that can drive a lot of stuff, right? And now we have this kind of like high fidelity, you know, like wear and tear around the little panels and, th and things like that. But we don't have anything that makes it look like the object itself, it like has, you know, contextual dirt. So we used vertex colors. And we just baked down like an AO mask and, you know, a concavity, convexity and things like that. And we used that to drive dirt, you know, wear and tear, rust, things like that. So now we can actually have things like uh, there's some, some you know, uh, dirt in like, you know, uh, in the, yeah, in the crevices between assets and things like that. And that helps because, you know, this is not a world that is, you know, very clean. It's actually a world with, you know, quite some age to it. You know, things need to look like they've been around for some time. And uh, doing, a, you know, doing something more like taking that to the next level and making objects actually look like they belong together, like when they sit next to each other, that's another challenge because we couldn't just go and vertex paint the entire world. That would take forever and the memory would just, you know, explode. So we need to find like another solution for that. And that's the, the third part, which is that we baked down the ambient occlusion mask in Unreal, which you can do. And we use that to inject that into the same pipeline with driving the dirt and the, the rust and things like that. So 
then you're doing like the more subtle things like you know you have some dirt up in the yeah around the crates and up in the i don't even know what to call it the sci-fi thingy uh, and uh, that looks you know it looks kind of good enough for like the dirt and the rust but uh, it does come with like quite a bit of texture cost which is fine because we only have one texture so we have a lot of memory left over but we still wanted to look a little bit more uh, handcrafted so we did oh, and that's the little node that does the thing so you need glowy bits and you know need decals because otherwise it's not sci-fi so we just added another uv set where we could add like uh, decals and things like that and you know emissive and we mask the same way but in a separate uv set so this way we could just uh, do that like little extra custom things you know like uh, lots of you know custom patterns you know uh, warning stripes because everything has warning stripes in the future all that stuff and uh, once we have the dirt it's very easy to remove it again uh, and that allows us to support like a very wide range of props uh, and settings so for example like we have this slum and you know this lab and they're using the same texture same master shaders you know it's just we get a lot of perceived variety even though we don't actually have much variety uh, which is the goal and uh, so basically once you have it it's easy to turn it off again and now that we have a uh, you know pretty flexible pipeline we needed to make it faster because it's like it's very cool to have all these choices but then we're back to having all these choices which is not always great because sometimes you just want to hurry up and do your thing so we set a fixed number of things like you can only have three colors and you can only have three metals that's it so when you build your assets you kind of had to plan with this in mind um, and we then we made things like okay we're gonna automate as much as possible like we build our tools around these limitations like we basically had like a uh, pie menu for just saying like hey do you want color one two three and do you want metal emissive decals and you just selected polygons and you just went bloop, 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 bloop. Here it looks like in Modo. Done, export, everything works. Plop on a shader, you know, you're done. And uh, that also helps with the art direction because that's another thing, you know. We're going to have a very busy world. There's a lot of stuff in there. We don't want all the colors in the world. We need to be very constrained with our color palette so you only get three um, because the scene will have more colors anyway, but no one cares about your little asset, you know, we care about the scene. So we put these limitations into place so people could design the assets with that in mind. Like, you have three colors, what are you going to use them for? Like, I'm going to have the inside, I'm going to have the outside, and I'm going to have the little cable bits. Like, okay, good, do that, done, move on. And uh, that, uh, that helped a lot in just, like, narrowing down the palette because, like I said, you know, like, the game can be very busy visually uh, and having even more colors wouldn't help. And this is kind of how it just, we're like, we had a button, you know, pressing, bake, vertex color, export. Uh, that was just like, once we had the limitations and like, we're like, this is what we're doing. This is how we, you know, basically limit ourselves. Another good thing with this is that we have extremely low texture usage because we only have one. So it's very easy to have 4K textures if you only have one. Um, that meant that we could cut down the things like the memory uh, limitations or like the memory pool on, on the consoles from like the default in Unreal, which is like one gig, something like 400 megs. And on the vast majority of that was things like light maps, reflection probes, stuff like that. We used less than, uh, I think, 40 megs for the world textures uh, at any, uh, any given time, which was pretty good. And we also had another good benefit that we didn't really think about, but became very obvious later, which was that we can reuse the materials because everything is using the same master shader. So if you made like this ship shader, actually, spoiler alert, it was the same shader on all of them. Uh, and uh, you could just take shaders and you can apply it to like whatever you want. And since everything is using the same system, it will, you know, just work. And uh, that meant that we could very quickly iterate on the look of an entire area because you know you could just have like the same you know shader that you have on this crate and you just slap it on like basically half the things and if you wanted to adjust the colors you just adjust adjusted one color and you adjusted the entire scene like, i want to make the scene more uh, dirty 
pull the slider, the scene is now more dirty uh, because you have things like material inheritance in Unreal with the material instances. So we could just quickly iterate on the look of an entire area. You know, and that meant we could reuse content very, very easily. Uh, for example, here we have a data core with shiny white things. And then we have the dirty sewers and it's the same models, same shaders, same textures. This is a completely different vibe. And it's just because we can just, you know, quickly take this, copy paste it, add some glowy bits, uh, stuff like that. So very, very useful for just getting a lot of mileage out of our content and making it seem like we have more content than we do. Because we were only four people in the art team at the peak. Um, so we had to do a lot of stuff. And also good because it's enforcing the art direction. Because we have one texture, we have one master shader, it's very easy to stick to the directions because you know you just use what you have. You grab kit bashed pieces that already work. Uh, so we didn't have to stop and, uh, you know, I didn't have to stop an art direct very much, which was very nice. I could just let people do stuff. And everything will have a unified look in the materials because there is only one material, so it's going to have a unified look. And uh, also very good. You know, when, you know, game designers come knocking and they're like, this mech needs a flamethrower. I'm like, no, wait, it's going to have a grenade launcher. And you're like, okay, cool. I don't need to rebake anything. I can just go in and drag things down, re-UV re map it, export it. And there we go. It's very iteration friendly. Um, so, and also like the more things you build, the more you just take that, you're like, oh, this is a nice shape. This is a nice cluster of cables. And then you just copy, put, copy paste that. You put it into the kit bash library. And now we can just reuse it whenever you feel like adding some cool cables. And another thing that was very good is that they didn't have any technical surprises because everything was built the same way. No one accidentally made a model that had giant textures. No one accidentally made a very dense model because it was the same, same workflow, same style. So it was very, very predictable. Same thing, you know, like the, we almost never had to care about shaders or polygons because, you know, it was very like, it was very simple to predict. So that was very thankful when we had to optimize the game. So another good thing that happened with kit bashing is that you know it allowed us to go further than we thought. Because in the, in the beginning, we're like, okay, we know what fidelity we're gonna have. This is a good bar. And we were completely wrong uh, because then we're like, you know, we built this big, I think the asset is called like fuel station 01B or whatever. And then we're like, I, I, we put it on a pillar and scale it down. And we're like, actually, that looks pretty good. It's not meant to be that scale. And that just allowed us to, you know, kit bash things together and just unlock a little bit more detail than we, you know, thought that we needed. Same thing, we you know, like small pipes and things like that, where we built them to make, the, there should be like half a meter in diameter and then you scale them down. And you're like, actually, you know, the details kind of work when they're, you know, scaled down. And that just allowed us to unlock like another tier. So we created like over 8,000 assets for the ascent, uh, and we were, the, which is the average is like three per day uh, per artist. And most of the days we did not create any assets. So the actual rate was way, way higher than that. Uh, I think the biggest set pieces we had took three days to build for an artist. So it was a very, very efficient uh, workflow in that way, because you know it kind of had to be. So now that we have this you know, giant pile of models, uh, we still needed to build the actual world. And uh, it's very, you know, it's, it's very big and dense, but at the same time, we also need to add a lot of life to the world. So just placing the meshes is not enough. We need to do more. So we need to assemb assemble it fast enough to have time to add all the other stuff. Um, because, uh, so basically, we, we built a bunch of tools to help us, you know, populate the world. And we tried to take the approach of, uh, taking all the monotonous and boring things that people don't want to do and try to automate uh, or make cool tools. So, okay, I have to go a bit faster, I think. So we leaned heavily on Houdini for making these kind of tools. So for example, we had a pipe tool. You just made a profile and generated like a modular set of pipes complete with you mapping everything, which is very nice you know, because no one wants to bend pipes forever. And at the same time, no one wants to place pipes. So we made a, a tool for just, uh, you know, placing pipes uh, using, you know, like this modular system and you can just drag them out. 
And no one wants to sit and rotate pipes around. It's very boring, uh, which then means that you're not going to place those pipes. And having tools like this allow artists to actually you know, enjoy placing pipes, which meant that we're going to have more intricate pipe networks and, and things like that. So that was very, very you know, handy because that allowed us to do things that we didn't think that we would be you know, bothered to do because it's, you know, it's painful, but now it's less painful. Same thing, you know, we had a, a tool for making uh, buildings, essentially. We could take boxes and Boolean shapes, uh, Boolean shapes, and then we had like different uh, style presets using modular pieces. So we could just, you know, out, like build an entire area of the game, just blocking it out with boxes, and then it has meshes now. And then you could go in and do the detailing and set dressing instead of focusing on placing 152, 512 pieces of trims and then duplicating them down and replacing them with a different module and things like that. So some parts of the game, like uh, 30, 40% of the models were placed this way. And in some places, like, you know, almost none of them, but it was a very, very useful tool. Same thing, uh, you know, we had a lot of destruction we didn't want to actually, you know, make destruction, so we automated that completely. And since we're a two-dimensional game, essentially, gameplay-wise, we always know where the shots are coming from. So instead of actually having real destruction, we just made a bunch of animations, and then we just play the one that is aligned to the player. So it looks like they will, uh, you know, break dynamically from the direction you're shooting, but it's actually just an animation. So it's, like, super cheap, and we can just have, like, ho however much we want. And we also have like a shitload of cables. And it's also one of those things like people don't like, you know, sitting and modeling cables. So we had a number of tools for, you know, placing cables in the world, you know, both custom, you know, aligning to the floor, generating piles of cables, modules with cables, all this kind of stuff. Um, we had a ton of that. Same thing, like we wanted to do a lot of world building. And, you know, this is one of those things that, like, that's not very fun to do. It's, like, to make lots and lots of signs. So we actually made a tool where we can just write whatever we want, and we have some little extra uh, stuff going on, like extra um, art direction things. And then you could, you know, pick font, type it in, make signs, do a lot of, you know, world building that way. Same thing with signs. It's also one of those things, like, we could just input text, had lots of different style options. Uh, Everything from like making neon signs to just making blinking signs with vertex shaders, all kinds of stuff. Uh, also, just like, let's see, it's going to be blinking soon. Um, very, uh, yeah, there we go, like some automatic blinking signs. Uh, that's the kind of stuff that is also like very time consuming to do. And once we had the world, you know, we need to add some life to it. and. Uh, we didn't have like a separate team that would go in and add things to give life to the world. That was all the artist as well. So we made things that were like solid enough that the artist could basically use these things as set dressing. So for example, we didn't have any civilians or NPCs in the beginning, which you know made the world feel very empty. And then we added like static NPCs that we put in the background. But then it was weird because the game just had lots of people, but no one where you were running. So we, we eventually had AIs that, you know, run away when you shoot them uh, or like run, run away, panic, everything. Um, but we made them so that the artist could actually use them as set dressing, essentially. So instead of them being spawned by some system that plays some generic uh, NPCs, we just used, used set dressing. So the artist could actually be like, oh, I'm going to have a group of people sitting here. One of them is angry. Here's a bunch of drunk people throwing up, like all the, you know, necessary things for a dystopian uh, future. Uh, so we made that part of the set dressing pro uh, process. We also needed a lot of, you know, blinky sci-fi advertisement stuff, and because uh, you can't have cyberpunk without it. So we actually tried to have like shaders that we animated, but that you know took forever because animating math is hard and uh, takes a lot of time. So we tried to actually make movie clips, uh, which is you know. You can do a lot cooler stuff, but actually rendering that in Unreal is super expensive. So we just hacked it and we just took 12 of them and we put them into one movie texture instead and made it really low res. And that meant that we could actually swap, uh, swap channels by just moving the UVs. So we could have tons and tons of screens and they're all playing the same movie clip, the same you know, instance of everything. And you just move the UVs around randomly and you have you know, different things and you can do things like playlists on TVs. Uh, but they were not casting light, and with this camera angle, you don't, you don't really 
benefit much from screen space reflections because a lot of cool stuff is outside the screen. So instead we blurred the movies down to like one pixel average color and then we just outputted a CSV curve from Houdini with that and we just animate the lights with that thing. So it looks like it's casting light from the movie but it's actually not. And then, then we can do lots of things like having a just giant Blade Runner style billboards like that are off screen and things like that and just casting this very dynamic looking light. Uh, uh, yeah, right. So to, to, to summarize, it was uh, simplifying the process was uh, you know, a great success, basically. It, uh, it allowed us to just keep focusing on creating more content, you know, not stopping and thinking how we should do things. We just, you know, we're going to build this environment. We're like, yeah, it's, you know, let's just get started. We don't need to figure out the specifications because we already have them. They're, they're locked down. And that saves us a lot of time. Um, one of the downsides is that it's a little bit scary because you're like, okay, this is our pipeline. Is it going to work in the end? I don't know. Are you going to get really tired of this kit bashing texture after like, you know, 15 hours of playing the game? Like, I don't know. We, we don't really know. And it's very hard to change the course once you're, you know, once you set the course, right? Um, but thankfully, you know, it worked, but it's also one of those scary things to be like, to, to commit to basically. Uh, but it also removed a lot of visual and technical noise. Like we had a very predictable pipeline. We could focus on other parts of the optimization. We could focus on like having more civilians. We could focus on having more dynamic lighting because we didn't have to care about shaders. We didn't have to care about polygons. So that removed a lot of that, you know, guesswork. And it also made the game a lot more visually cleaner because we had, you know, unified shape language because, you know, the, the shape language was dictated by the textures and the kit bashing. Uh, it also helped with, the, you know, the shaders having a limited color palette. That also helped you know, when we were, you know, uh, you know, tweaking things because it was very easy to just like, okay, let's have less colors here, like a, you know, a more narrow palette. And we were just done. Very nice. Uh, yeah, like I said, it, it reinforced the art direction uh, because, you know, by brute force, essentially. But it's also like, uh, you know, everyone, you know, loves to make, you know, cool rules and like, you know, uh, this is how we're going to do things. And then basically as soon as you hit production, people are not doing that because, you know, rules are very boring, uh, you know, by the, but they work. And uh, people are always tempted to like, okay, we have this cool pipeline and they're like, well, it doesn't fit exactly what I want to do. Like, I want to have this little thing. And then it's like, okay, I'm just going to abandon the pipeline and do my thing. And that's where you kind of have to go like, no, stick to the pipeline, you know, believe in it. Uh, and think of the big picture, you know, it, which is not always easy when you're, you know, focusing on your little part of the game, you know. Uh, and, you know, if, uh, you know, what I would change is that, you know, uh, if, if we were to do a similar thing, which we are, because, you know, we're making more games, is that we actually didn't push the quality as much as we could because we made this giant world full of stuff. But the initial part, we were like, oh, what are we actually going to do? Like, how's the you know, shaders going to work? How's it going to look? That part was like a tiny bit. And then the actual building everything was like the giant bit. And we probably could have spent more time just making it look better so that it could, uh, uh, so that it, uh, yeah. So it would have looked better in the end if we would have spent more time just pushing the quality even further. So that's, uh, that's a lesson that we learned. And uh, yeah, we didn't spend an equal amount, like parts of the pipeline got super much love because we're like, oh, we're going to do this modeling and the shaders and it's going to be perfect. And then we didn't spend an equal amount of time polishing up other parts. And yeah, and if you thought all of that sounds, you know, awesome and uh, we are very cool or even better, if you think that we are kind of like suck a little bit and you can do it better, we are hiring. <laughs> so yeah, thank you. for taking us into the beautiful world of the Ascent. And do you have any questions? We have time for two questions. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. I got a question regarding um, this uh, video clip where you have like eight different, different videos. First of all is all of the videos had to loop at the same time or at least be twice the length? Yeah, exactly. So or some three of them were, times the length. Yeah. 
Some were five seconds, some were 10 seconds, right. and then we just made them all loop. And other thing regarding um, video or other assets like that, for example, when there are eight videos there, and for some reason one of them is most popular amongst the designers, and the other one is least popular, is there a chance that one video uh, <clears throat> will be uh, most used in the game by your designers? Yeah, absolutely, and and that happened. I mean, we had one of them that I think is like in one place because it's like a te it's like a temp one with different colors, and she's called orbs, and she's a bunch of balls, and it's like we don't use that very much. But we also didn't have time to make another one. <laughs> so it's... Right. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. Uh, thank you for the great talk. I have a question. Uh, assuming that you introduced quite strict rules on how assets are prepared. Uh, how did you approach uh, the prototype of the game so that you were 100% sure that the approach works and that you don't uh, have a situation that after creating 90% of the game, you see that rules don't work? Well, I also cheated a little bit because I have been you know, working with this kind of stuff for like 10 years. So I've already done like 12 that didn't work. Uh, and we also had like, you know, the first pipeline that I did also didn't work because that was without the kit bash parts and things like that. So we did iterate on the pipeline in the beginning and, you know, found out like, what do I need and how do I achieve it? So it was a little bit of iteration work in the beginning um, uh, when, and then I also all by myself. So I could just come up with whatever I wanted because no one could stop me. Okay, thank you. Okay, one more final questions. Okay, here we go, sir. Hi, thanks for the talk. I've got one question about going down and pushing things down. Obviously, there were screenshots when you've seen pretty much the island that hovers in the air, and there is some part of the world underneath. So such parts, was it different levels or locations that you can actually access as a player, a reuse, or was it some kind of matte painting just for filling the down parts of the world? Initially, we wanted to be like, oh, it would be cool if you saw an area and then you go there later. And we have a, a couple of those in the game. And without exception, all of them were painful because then the artists were like, we're going to make this area look nice. And they're like, and then you look at it from a distance. Yes, so now we just have double the amount of content. So we actually had, you know, that was uh, something that we realized that it's, uh, it sounds very cool, but it was really painful to make. So for the most part, it's just, you know, Vista stuff. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Tor. That was all for, for this presentation. You can catch uh, Tor in the, in the back of, the, of the, our session. And thank you very much. Thank you.